Okay, we're gonna start. Let's take it away. All right, so apologies to anyone that I just made deaf with that sound test. It was not intended. There's always problems with sound, so you always just got to figure it out. Um, I've kind of moved up a little bit. I don't know if I look like being touched by an angel with the lighting, but just bear with me, please. At least the screen is not reflecting like mad. Thank you for having me here, B-Sides. It's great to be in person again. I haven't been at a conference in person since 2019, so it's really cool to have actual real life people to speak to. Um, apologies for the ums, now I'm like super aware of that after Haroon brought it up. <laughs> Thanks for that. All right, so my talk today is called All Bark No Bites. That will make more sense a little bit later in the presentation. So are you actually at a information security conference if someone doesn't have a who am I slide coming up on the screen? Uh, so let me just give you a quick introduction about who I am. For my day job, I am a vulnerable machine engineer for Offsec. It means that I get to create really cool vulnerable machines in a lab environment. And I love my job because I get to build and solve puzzles simultaneously while making one thing. Uh, something that I am super proud of that I sit and do in my free time is an initiative called Pay It Forward. Um, I got a really great opportunity to get into the information security field through an internship and it was as cheesy as it sounds life-changing for me and it became a personal goal to be able to do the same thing for other people and I got the opportunity to do that a lot sooner than I had planned and up to today uh, the Paid Forward initiative has given 19 people a PWK voucher so for anyone who doesn't know, that's the course to get your OSCP certification. And that's 90 days of the lab, that's full access to the course, the videos, and an exam voucher. So like I've met two of my candidates today who are Cape Town based, I'm Joburg based, and that's something that you know I, I get a lot of satisfaction out of doing. Uh, so you know, just to start with a little disclaimer, this presentation is going to contain deep fake material no infringements is intended i'm not entirely sure if some of the stuff i've done is totally legal but we'll see <laughs> um all right cool so what is a deep fake everyone's probably heard of that and there's different kinds of deep fakes and there's different kind of technology that's used to make these things but essentially what it's doing is it's taking some kind of base media and it's manipulating it in such a way that it now appears to be something else. Whether that is done with imagery or videos or audio or a combination of all of them, that's essentially a deepfake in very, very simple terms. Now, what people seem to enjoy doing is putting Steve Buscemi's face on a lot of celebs and they tend to be women. So it's this really weird thing where you see like Steve Buscemi's face a lot. Um, and <laughs> You can literally Google like a deep fake before and after and you'll see a lot of these things and a lot of Steve Buscemi. And I have dubbed it the face replace because essentially what they're just doing is they're taking and they're not changing the majority of the image, they're just sticking someone else's face on it. And I think that there's a lot of really, really poorly done deep fakes online then you get some really, really good ones. And at the moment, they're the exception and not the rules. So I don't know why this is showing as blank. This is, and I hope you don't go deaf. This is someone called Deep Tom Cruise. This guy's name is Miles Fisher. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him after I show you kind of what he's known for. Please play. Comply. Paris, I don't want to be late to this premiere. We gotta go. You should always run faster than you. What's your name? You're so absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm going to be honest. Hmm. Enjoy your shirt, Mr. Cruz. You know, really in a while, the room. Yeah. Can you put your hand over there? Can you put your hand over there? I don't want to speak. No, please. Anything. Story in my life. All right, now we're going to start out in this thing. You ready? I do my own sense. All right, so 
Miles Fisher is not Tom Cruise, obviously. So the person in that video is not Tom Cruise at all. It is the real Paris Hilton. And Miles Fisher works with a company called Metaphysic. And Metaf Metaphysic uh, specialize in AI technology, but essentially they're creating deep fakes. And in my opinion, they are the people that are creating the most convincing deep fakes. So a lot of this introductory stuff does deal with a lot of kind of popular culture, but I think that it does just show how impressive some of this stuff can be. So uh, Metaphysic actually entered America's Got Talent. I mean, that's quite an unusual contestant to have a tech company enter a talent show, but you're going to see. Now, I have never seen Simon Powell get to his feet as fast as he did when he saw this act. Mind you, he was the act. If none of that makes any sense, it will in a minute. Here's Metaphysic. Now, I... So, I mean, Hardy Klum is absolutely losing her shit. Simon Cowell is, is uh, shocked. And you can see that there's three people that have walked onto the stage. And on the big screen behind them is this picture of Elvis, seemingly live. Uh, you look like so I mean apart from seeing Simon Cowell's wonderful reaction of seeing himself as a performer it's 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 really impressive what they're doing so metaphysic is was created one of the creators his name is Chris Oom um, and they specialize in especially these real-time deep fakes of being able to kind of superimpose one likeness on top of another person's face um, and coming back to Miles Fisher so that is Miles Fisher his real likeness on the left and obviously Tom Cruise on the right and the thing is is that these kind of deep fakes or AI technology it has some limitations and I want to take you through them. So despite them being really, really good and, you know, they can do it in real time and it's, it's super impressive. Miles Fisher is a professional Tom Cruise impersonator. This guy has a similar likeness. Sure. He doesn't look exactly the same, but there's a likeness there. He has learned how to sound like Tom Cruise's voice. So there's no editing or anything like that anything that they need to change there when it comes to his voice. Uh, some of the limitations as well is, you know, these, this technology struggles a little bit. Like, is the hairline of Miles and Tom exactly the same? Is their jawline the same? Their mannerisms? How much of an, like, an emotion and expression do you get when this AI is sticking someone else's face on yours? And that tends to be where it kind of, it starts to look fake. And these things are going to get so good that you're going to have to trust your instincts and be like, hey, I don't know, that thing just, there's just something about it in maybe one frame that just doesn't look right. But anyway, we're getting a little bit sidetracked here. So we are hackers, right? So we want to think, how can we use this kind of stuff in an offensive way, right? Um, so if you want to have a deep fake of someone for whatever reason, we'll get to motive a little bit later. There's going to be some challenges, right? So you have to have your target and you're going to have to find someone who looks like your target. And then they're also going to have to be on board with whatever illegal activity you're doing. So you might not want to do that for various reasons. Okay. So how do you actually weaponize a deep fake, right? And that's the question I asked myself and I'm going to take you through how I did it. I'm sure that there are a lot of different ways to do it. But this is just my way. And then I also kind of realized that the talk probably should have been called deep fakes for dummies because that's just essentially what it is. And I want to take you to, I want to take you through the two aspects of speech in, in the visual kind of way so that you're hearing me talk, but you're also seeing me talk. Um, and the first thing is how a mouth moves. And one of the aspects is called a visine. So vis like visual. 
what that means is just there are certain mouth movements that accompany the words or the sounds that you're making and you will not really realize that you're doing it because I think everyone here is hearing so we kind of think of this as something that hearing impaired people do but you will do this on a subconscious level and you will know when there is a disjoint between what is being said vis visually and what are you hearing from an audio perspective so what I found is a really great way to kind of demonstrate this is there's a YouTube channel and they do what they call bad lip syncing so if there's any Stranger, fa uh, Stranger Things fans here this one is especially for you like most 12 year olds back then my family life revolved around the dinner table I have to do something wicked in my talent show. Well, you need impressions. Actually, I thought I would just say super free. Hey, I got a lovely tattoo. I'll show you when we're done. Uh, is it a well? No. It's cool. But is it super free? Is it wine glass? There must be jealousy in this house. What, is a boy jealous? Because I'm sure not. Let's get to clean dad's bath. Ew, uh, I'm going to shove you under the couch and leave. What'd you just say? How'd you shove her? You scared the soup out of me. Where, where? <laughs> She's not soup freak. You were kid. That I am. All right, so if you've watched Stranger Things, you're going to realize that that was definitely not part of the show. And what you're hearing sometimes doesn't make sense. It's like a cohesive conversation, but it all looked right. It all sounded right between what you were hearing and seeing. So we come to the second part of this, and this is what's actually being said. So these are called phonemes and what phonemes mean is it's just we can only make a certain variety of sounds and when we speak we kind of combine these sounds in different ways to make words and then magically other people know what you're saying because they also understand the same kind of sounds you're making so that is an oversimplification of phonetics but it's good enough for the purposes that we need so how do we use this again and generally when you're speaking about making some kind of vocal clone, you need a data set. And data sets, you can sometimes compensate, like do you need quality or do you need quantity? But when it comes to cloning people's voices, you actually need both. And there's no shortcut around that. So what a lot of places do, like researchers, they use celebrities and politicians because they're natural data sets. These people speak and they speak a lot. So you like Joe Rogan, for example, I did a talk two years ago and I used Joe Rogan because he literally is just a walking data set with his, uh, with his podcast. So another great example is, as I said, politicians. So let's hear. Hello. I'm Barack Obama, and I have been convinced to say some ridiculous things for besides Cape Town 2022. And this kind of thing is really, really easy to do. You just kind of punch it into Google once again, and it will take you to a site. Cool, I want to say something as Obama, and it's done. So, Hello. I'm Barack Obama. I'm Barack. You don't have to hit it again. Um, so, what kind of tools do you, do you use if you want to have a little bit more control over this yourself, and Barack Obama is not your your target. So this, there's, there's various tools. The first one I'm going to talk about is called Descript. This used to be called Liabird. I've spoken a little bit before about Liabird. It's a really, really good technology for creating vocal clones. Another one is called Murph AI. And then a third one that I came across is called Resemble AI. And why I was particularly interested in Resemble AI is because when you get into their dashboard, you see this option. And I thought, bingo, this is exactly what I need. When I've experimented with these tools before, I've generally done it with my own voice, which is easy because, you know, in this machine and I can do whatever I want. But if I'm trying to clone someone else's voice, this just makes it a whole lot easier. But it didn't work. So I thought, OK, well, that makes sense. They're not going to let you do it for free. So I stuck my credit card, well, not a credit card numbers in and bingo i've been upgraded so that's wonderful but it still didn't work so what do you do next you email support because well it's not working and then i realized why it's not working because i need fifteen thousand usd to mess around with this tool and as much as i'm invested in my research like i just don't have that amount of money to 
to mess around with that. So we're not going to do that, right? We're just going to be moving along. So I took a little bit of a step back and I thought, who should I target? Like who's going to be someone who's got a good data set that I can work with and that would be relevant? Because a lot of these things that we see work with, you know, politicians in America or, you know, Putin in Russia and let's let's try and make it as local as possible so who else but let's see our president and let's see all right so you just do a google search and you do for videos and there's over a million so cool data set box checked um and now the actual attack so now i've got to figure out all right cool how am i actually going to do this and uh, my kind of outlook on this especially when i do social engineering which essentially this is is that if you start, like you try and stay as close to the truth as possible, something's going to be a lot more successful because uh, it just kind of minimizes your chances of getting caught out. Or kind of that's what I thought, right? So if anyone has tried to mess around with any kind of sound engineering or anything like that, you might know this logo. This is for a tool called Audacity. It's 100% open source uh, and it allows you to do a whole bunch of things. So I downloaded Audacity and I then started trawling through YouTube and you go through a whole bunch of transcripts and you you have an idea of what you want to do and you start downloading these things and listening and taking out what you need. So what I created and what I'm calling this is a vocal quilt. I am taking things that have really been said but I'm using from different places and I'm rearranging it in a way that is something Cyril never said. I don't know how big it is on the screen, but if you read the the notes that I've made, it says ESCOM will increase load shedding over the next 12 months, which is what we all want to hear, right? Um, so cool. So we've got the what has been said sorted in a very, very simple way. Like we did not use high-tech solutions here. We really kept it very, very simple. But that's sorted, but now, as you've seen, the mouth has got to move the right way, otherwise it's just going to look very, very weird. And if you edit that in such a way, you're going to have those like those weird breaks, and it's, it's not going to flow in the same way as someone who's just speaking like in the moment. So how do we do this mouth manipulation? And, you know, the internet is a very, very wonderful place. Chances are you are not the first person to think of what you're doing. So you need to just look around and see if the solution you need already exists. And it does. In th There are various solutions, but this is the one I went with. So you literally go onto GitHub. It's called Wave to Lip, Wave to Lip and it does exactly what it says on the, on the slide. That you can lip sync a video and audio that can come from completely different places and make it look right. So what we're winning here is that we're doing all of this stuff locally. We're not doing this on some kind of web app where we're going to leave some trace. And we have that kind of sense of control over it. So this is what it looks like when you're using it. It's a command line based tool. I don't think that it's particularly difficult. I think anyone who's a little bit savvy will be able to figure it out. Just getting it installed is literally the most difficult part. If we'll chuck a bunch of areas that you want to get those sorted, you're good to go. And you're going to see what I was able to create. ESCOM will increase load shedding over the next 12 months. Now, everyone's going to have a different opinion, whether you think that that's convincing or not. So again, please remember that this is really, really quite low tech solutions. It can obviously get much, much better. But the benefit here is that we're all used to seeing a Cyril with that backdrop. We got quite accustomed to it during lockdown so you know that's like second nature seeing him there and it's quite believable from that perspective also what i'm going to show you is the original versus what i did so that you can see that you still have those natural kind of gestations and body movement from him speaking escom will increase load shedding over the next 12 months so, all right, we've created a deep fake where we can impersonate or have some kind of level of control over our president. But what is our motive behind this? If you work in the information security industry, which I'm sure a lot of people here do, you know the power of information. 
And equally, if not more powerful, is um, disinformation. So what is disinformation? It's being able to use something in a way to convince someone of something that is just entirely untrue. And then to be able to leverage that to some kind of end goal, which is, you know, we're now talking politically here, it's some kind of destabilization or control or in whatever capacity that uh, that goes to. I would explain this, but I think that, sorry, I'm getting to a video, so I'm losing my place slightly. So I want to introduce you to something called Operation Infection. And Operation Infection was a, a team and a task done by the KGB. And what they specialized in was disinformation. Agents spent 25% of their time actively coming up with ideas for disinformation. Like how can we de destabilize shit using just crazy information, right? And there's a brilliant and by the New York Times, which explains it incredibly well. Come on. Three. And all the way over here, New Delhi, India. This is when a remarkable story appears in a newspaper called The Patriot. It claims the HIV virus was secretly created by US government scientists as a weapon to kill African Americans and gay people. It even names a facility, Fort Detrick in Maryland, where the virus was supposed to have been concocted. It's a crazy allegation printed in a small newspaper. No big deal, right? But fast forward just a couple of years and look what's happening. The story is spreading all over Africa. A scientific report's even published by two East German biologists who say they can prove AIDS was made in the USA. All these articles are from just a few months at the end of 1986. And then somehow, it ends up here. A Soviet military publication claims the virus that causes AIDS leaked from a U.S. Army laboratory conducting experiments in biological warfare. That's Dan Rather reading a fake news story to millions of unwitting Americans on national TV. So that sums it up. Uh, this operation in particular was really, really successful and it had really, really long lasting results. And there's probably a lot of people who still think that this is the case. And I'm sure everyone here knows someone who thinks that COVID was released from a uh, facility, a government facility. So you know, these things like they start to kind of like repeat themselves and they're kind of dangerous ideas because there's a lot that you can do with this. And this is just a wonderful little statistic. And this speaks about how many people. So this was the first time it was published, just to remind you of the dates, was 1983. That television broadcast was 1987. So, you know, five years later, a lot of people, 15% of Americans still think that that the AIDS virus or HIV AIDS was released from a government laboratory. In 2005, 50% of African Americans thought AIDS was man-made and you can read the rest. So despite the scientific community kind of fighting back and being like, this is absolute nonsense. There is no truth to this. It doesn't matter. Like the damage is already done. So you can try and fight this and, and the Americans did. They had a task force as of course they will, you know, the idea is there, you've planted the seed, you've done the damage, and therefore you've actually been quite successful. And the difference now, obviously, between 1983 and today is, you know, we have the internet, it's pretty obvious. So if the KGB were able to pull off something like that when you were relying on, like, you know, hard printed newspapers and stuff like that, we can do a lot of damage um, in whatever kind of vehicle we choose, but using the internet is particularly useful for this kind of thing. And it's kind of broken down into seven steps. So it's about finding the cracks in whatever society you're trying to attack. You then create the lie, and it's a big, bold lie, but you have to find that, that element of truth to it. The fourth part is making sure that you conceal your hand and people don't know that you were responsible for doing that thing. And then find someone who's 
an idiot and who can back you up, right? Because that's useful, especially if it's got dots in front because people are like, hey, he must know who he's, like, what he's talking about. The sixth step is to just deny everything because, you know, what are people going to do if you say you didn't do it? And then it's about just playing the long game and just waiting and seeing if what you did actually worked. And sometimes it's not going to, and sometimes it's going to work really, really well. Uh, and then if we think of like, okay, is there a kind of practical example of that in real time? And one of the things that I thought about was, hey, what about Cambridge Analytica? I mean, there was a huge scandal with them. They had access to a huge amount of data. You're able to target people with like immense accuracy when you're on a platform like Facebook. And if you have people who are not capable of critical thoughts or checking information, fact checking, uh, you definitely are able to manipulate how people how people think, how people feel, and how they're going to vote and how they're going to conduct themselves. And I mean, Cambridge Analytica was a self-described global election management agency. Like, it's even in like their description. Um, so I'm not the only person thinking about this. There is a organization called represent us it's probably like represent us as well and this is one of the most high quality convincing political deep fakes i have seen um with quite a, a like a powerful message democracy is a pleasure thing the pleasure thing you want to believe if we elect them for this asian democracy I don't have to do anything to return to the status. People are divided, the voting districts are manipulated, voting locations are judging, and it can vote. It's not hard for democracy to collapse. What do you have to do? What do you have to do? All right, so I don't spend a lot of time looking at defense because, like, I enjoy the offensive side of things, but I thought I would just touch on it. Of course, you know, there's going to be two sides to every coin. So as much as there are people creating deep fakes and seeing how much better can they get and how convincing can it be, there's equally going to be people who are saying, well, this is clearly a problem. We're going to need mechanisms to be able to at least detect and maybe tell people that what they're watching is not real. One of the ways that I came across during the research for this is that combination and comparison of the visemes and the phonemes. So is there something in a deep fake video where the mouth is moving in a way that doesn't match the sound? To me, I don't feel like that's going to age very well because I think that the better these things get, the harder it's going to be to detect those kind of inconsistencies. And like anything in this industry, it's a cat and mouse game. Whatever the defense come up with, you know, the offensive guys are going to be like, cool story. We're now going to find something to, you know, bypass that. And so the cycle starts again. And um, I'm now happy to answer any questions that you may have. Now there's a question here. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it's completely out of my domain to listen to this interesting person to talk to. Um, the bit that you skipped over the most because it's clearly not your area of interest is the one that tickled me. So perhaps it's a nice little dialectic at play. Um, for me, I can't look myself into the motion of wanting to build offensive defense of deep fakes. So I'd be really curious to hear from you. Like, what is it about it that excites you, that makes you want to build more? What, what are you getting out of it? Um, I think it's just out of curiosity. Like, you know, as I said, I used very like simple mechanisms to build this. And if I can do it, well, really, so can anyone else. 
Um, and one of the things I thought about is, I mean, I'm sure everyone here has or uses WhatsApp. And you've seen that thing forwarded many times, right? If someone can create something that's convincing enough and they can then disseminate it and enough people believe it, it's that's really because you're now you're now not just hacking some kind of software or some operating system you're now hacking people and to me that's quite a, that's got a powerful impact exactly exactly so you know with that forwarding you lose the quality you know those things are forgivable you'll kind of write them off subconsciously of like, oh, you know, it's just some kind of glitch or something like that. You're not necessarily going to think immediately, maybe this, maybe this is a deep fake. A lot of people won't even think it. They'll just blindly believe. Well, you know, Cyril's saying it has to be true. <laughs> I mean, we know better, but. <laughs> yeah. One of the strong things, the political aspect of this, which is very thrilling and scary in many ways, um, how about the more just uh, prosaic, uh, you know, um, major security stuff? So, um, you know, we, we were relying increasingly on um, uh, black biometric authentication. So, you know, people were trying to make things more secure, so there's more serious things like, you know, all kinds of apps these days are. Um, they're using like biometrics and videos to authenticate people and um, so they think like they can track security down to people and all that stuff. Um, and while that's a step in the right direction, it almost seems like you know the deep fake technology is catching up even faster than you know those technologies have been adopted. So we're at a point where like anyone could just deep fake to you know author or feature themselves as someone else and do identity theft or Get access to your bank accounts, or um, you know, we're increasingly doing things over teleconferencing where you could, um, you know, have someone meet and you just impersonate someone. Um, yeah, what, do you, what do you have thoughts on that? Definitely. So, uh, two, two ways I'm going to answer that question. The first is I was lucky enough to be part of a, ten, a pen test where we tested that authentication, where I'm sure you, anyone's seen it. You're trying to set something up in your banking and it comes up with the screen and it's like put your face in the oval and then it goes a bunch of colors so that's doing a liveness test exactly what's happening on the back end i would be lying if i told you i knew but there is something there that would prevent it from just you know facing that camera at a screen and being able to fool it i think that it's a bit more sophisticated than that for now at least so from that perspective i think for now like we're okay like don't know if it's going to stay that way. The talk that I did two years ago actually focused, I won't say exclusively, but it definitely focused on exactly the second part of your question, like uh, impersonating someone in a meeting. This is the thing is that there's, and as you saw with that Simon Cowell Elvis video, is that there's been significant improvements with being able to superimpose, superimpose a face in real time. People are battling to do that with voice. That seems to be lagging behind, but I think once people get it right reliably and you can do it in real time, it's it's going to be a shit show, to be honest. And I think that it's definitely a vulnerability. And if you are interested, I did speak about this quite a bit in, in my talk. You can find it on my website. And yeah, so South African banks use voice authentication as a means of authenticating yourself when you call through to the call center. So it's in my opinion, it's definitely a problem. And sometimes that happens like without you granting like, what is the word, consent for them to use your voice as an authentication means. I want to get in. One sneaky link, right? Uh, sure. Two questions. First one is, have you seen the TV series Capture? Sorry, the? TV series The Capture. No. Do go and watch it about the real time feedback. Okay. Second question is have you evaluated or looked at the detailed terms of the uh, real time detection of uh, deep fakes? I have not, but I mean, this is such a huge topic. When I started looking into this a couple of years ago, I kind of thought it was going to be a I mean, insulting to say easy, but I didn't think it was small. I just didn't realize. Um, 
how big this is and how many aspects there are to it. So I appreciate people in Q&As telling me about things that I hadn't seen or wasn't aware of. Um, there was a question in the front here as well. Seems to me that we need some sort of modicum of truth. Um, Facebook may come from a crisis of some kind where the right brain has been failing, and it's also resulted in classifying things as disinformation online. Interestingly, that the, the COVID jab leak hypothesis was banned on Facebook for a while. Then it was determined that the highest official level of the US government that might be true, might not be, that's just a trick thing. And then it's only allowed to discuss it on Facebook. So I don't think this kind of thing inspires confidence. Sure. Tightening. And sometimes also in politics, relatively strange depictions. We have very strange voters, people like Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, very comical figures, who would say very absurd things. Right. I've seen videos of Boris Johnson, and I'm very much really sure this could be a deep fake. It might not be. But <laughs> um, and uh, so, I mean, where am I going with this? I don't think they're deep to the philosophical problems that we need to solve. Maybe actually it's going to come back to us. We don't need to be the ones to decide, like, okay, this is a meme to attack people. You know, this, this information is likely false, likely false. Exactly. And uh, save the world, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and like, how do you do that? So I'm potentially asking the question that I don't even have an answer to. Like, so a lot of these developments are taking place, they're getting quite sophisticated, they're improving all the time who's policing that who's saying all right well this is it's okay to do this and it's not okay to do that and how do we tell people like there's no template there's no format like how do we tell people what they're seeing isn't real if you ask the text generating ai to code if you actually thought it across like scripting and the body is doing that. So the, the bigger question there is how do we classify things and who gets to decide that? So I think we're going to start seeing that, especially there's a, a thing called avatar on AI where you can just upload a couple of photos to you and it'll make these beautiful photos of you. Yeah, yeah I've seen them. You sit on them and into McDonald's, not even you technically. So it can get interesting. So totally. So on that note, just while you're walking there, there's a website called this person does not exist.com. And it's exactly what it says in the URL. So every time you refresh the page, it generates a fake person. So if you want to set up some kind of, you know, OSINT profiles, whatever you want to do, good place to start. Honestly, just with your own eyes, there will be giveaways like in that initial Tom Cruise video that I showed you, there's one frame where his face kind of like looks too big. I don't know if anyone picked up on that. There'll be like weird glitches, like with the way his face kind of moves. And, you know, the first time you watch it, you're like, huh? you know, Tom Cruise and Paris Hilton, what is going on here? Then you watch it again and you're like, something just, something just doesn't feel right. Like whenever I've given a talk or whenever I've spoken to people about security awareness it's just trust your gut that's literally don't like there will be tools and they will improve and they'll hopefully be able to tell us that these things aren't real but your gut instinct is generally the best thing to rely on thank you very much thank you so just quickly strawberries quarter past 11 so there's 12 minutes for that then same for track two and then also Rudolf Penning's OSINT workshop will also start at quarter past 11, and then lunch should be around 12-ish, and that's on the first floor where the coffee and stuff was. So that's just for general announcements. And then uh, Strauss used to be an organizer uh, passed away a while back, so we've got a kind of memorial book at the registration area if you want to write something about him. Also, the ink stacks come up when you take a photo, but you can send it to his family 
if he was quiet, that thing was up for him. Uh, we lost him, so we can certainly leave that man. We uh, lost him anyway, but it's always just fun to be a part of it. Uh, yeah, we'll see you back at 4 o'clock tonight.